Welcome back, Father Chris, and uh, greetings uh, to our viewers. <laughs> uh it's uh it's such a privilege to uh, to be able to catch up with you uh through this means of communication uh thank god for it uh we can um, uh, catch up with uh, uh, people we admire in this case with friends uh, and uh, colleagues uh, all over the world we can also know perhaps much more than we need about uh, the tragedy that unfolds elsewhere in the world. And uh, perhaps this is uh, yeah, a good conversation to have, uh, faith and science, including the more exotic uh, appendage uh, uh, <laughs> to this topic, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the clashing views of uh, creationism and evolutionism. But yes, um, uh, all, all this uh, somehow uh, makes a lot of sense these days when we uh, see uh, a uh, modern dictator um, unleashing hell upon uh, a sovereign nation, um, among other things, uh, invoking religion. Mm. invoking his faith and so on and so forth and the people of ukraine of course uh bear the brunt of uh of all this um mystical sense of uh um new russian imperialism mm. i don't know how to put it better anyway um back to business before uh, we actually uh, venture uh, to uh, discuss our, our topic, creation evolution, creationism, evolutionism, actually I, I draw a sharp line between these. Mm -hmm. I mean, the doctrine of creation and, and the theory of evolution are one thing and creationism and evolutionism are a different thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll get to it. But before before this, let's uh, let let's share uh, some good news. Um, the viewers are um, aware, of course, of the fact that uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Father Chris was uh, was my guest, and we had a very interesting uh, conversation on general matters pertaining to uh, faith and science, or science and religion, and uh, actually. Um, uh, the last part of that conversation, um, uh, Father Chris um, talked uh, a lot about um, divine agency, and I think I would like to take it from there uh, for today's conversation. This is just to, to, to show uh, those who are new uh, where to find that conversation. So it's uh, um, the Australian Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies, that, that's uh, uh, the YouTube channel. Um, this is um, the playlist uh, of uh, IOX conversations. Uh, and uh, uh, this, of course, is uh, um, the previous conversation with, with Father Chris. He, uh, uh, I, I left it live. Uh, by the way, uh, something that is quite encouraging for, for my channel, <laughs> Uh, it has been viewed so uh, in uh, in this interval of two weeks uh, by 115 people, liked by 10. This doesn't happen to me. <laughs> and uh, just today, uh, I, uh, I I found a uh, uh, a comment uh, from a friend actually from the United States uh, who uh, pointed out the fact that. Uh, uh, what I said at some point is actually uh, incorrect. Uh, the book, uh, uh, The Supernatural, uh, Le Surnaturel, uh, is by Henri de Lubac, not uh, by Congar. Uh, so my mistake, my mistake. Uh, and uh, uh, apart from this, I actually enjoy seeing people watching these videos and even making comments. Uh, but also, uh, there, there's um, uh, another possibility to get to uh, to that video via the 
website of, uh, uh, of IOX uh, where you can find uh, uh, this um, uh, tab here, Faith and Science. There it is. I had, uh, after Father Chris, another conversation with uh, uh, a Sydney-based uh, uh, cosmologist. And uh, this is uh, my brief uh, written report on, uh, on Father Chris and the talk that we had. So the video can be also watched here. And on this note, uh, let's, uh, let's return to uh, what I mentioned uh, just a minute or so ago, uh, divine agency. I think this topic that you have addressed um, in the last part of our conversation, uh, is of uh, tremendous importance for the topic of creation and, and evolution, isn't it? Uh, could you uh, walk us through uh, a summary of, uh, uh, of your views about divine agency, please, Father Chris? Happily. Well, some, some of my approach comes out of my reaction against the way in which um, many of the Western Christian conversations about this topic have tended to take it for granted that we have an autonomous cosmos, which God, to some extent, you know, visits from time to time, acts in from time to time. Um, and this has quite a long history. It goes back at least to the 18th century and the way that the deists viewed creation. But you could argue that it goes right back to the Middle Ages in the sense that um, there was a tendency for Western scholasticism, which in its original form was actually quite subtle, um, to be oversimplified by what were often called the neo-scholastics, particularly from the 16th, 17th century onwards. So that there was a tendency to talk about a pure nature in, uh, in that way of talking and, uh, and thinking about this issue. Um, and so the question then was, well, how do we understand God's action? How do we understand miracles? And what that meant was effectively that you had a picture of God's action where he was completely outside of the creation and from time to time sort of zoomed in, so to speak, did something supernaturally um, and then got out again, um, which may have been helpful at the time in helping people think through um, the reality of miracles and so on. But it actually went against something which is really quite fundamental to the orthodox doctrine of creation and which in fact has been rediscovered at least to some extent in modern Western Christian thinking. And this is the notion that to talk about God and the world as separated in that sort of way doesn't do justice to the reality, which we find particularly in the Orthodox Church um, among our sort of classic theologians in Maximus the Confessor, who talked about the way in which the logos of God, the, if you like, the logical principle of God, whom we see incarnate in Christ, is also, to some extent, to be seen in the way in which there is a logos, a word, a logical principle, a way of behaving, if you like, um, which belongs to every created thing. So in Maximus, that was expressed in terms of this distinction between the Logos, who we talk about as the second person of the Trinity, and the Logoi, the Logos, if you want to have a, an anglicizing of the, of the plural, um, which we see in each created thing. And many of the modern commentators on, on Maximus have emphasized that for Maximus, all of those logoi of created things participate in some sense in the divine logos himself. So what you actually have there is a picture, not of God who is separated from the creation, but God who is at the heart of every created thing. Um, and much later in St. Gregory Palamas, you have a distinction between the divine essence, the usia, um, which as human beings, we can never know, we can never participate in. So that stops us having a, a sort of pantheistic picture. God, there is that in God, which is utterly beyond uh, the creation and created things. But there's also what 
St. Gregory called the divine energies, which again uh, permeate the creation um, and again make every created thing um, at least potentially a sort of sacramental presence of God in the creation. So if you put those two together, what you have in the orthodox doctrine of creation, and they're not, uh, they're not competing, they are in fact complementary understandings. You have a picture of God who is at the heart of all created things, at the heart of all processes in the created order. And what you get in terms of the way in which we think about divine action from that is a very interesting, at least to me, um, understanding in which we can actually rethink what we think by naturalism, because naturalism is usually understood in, in terms of that which is, you know, it's rather like a clockwork process. It's, um, I mentioned last time, the deistic understanding of the 18th century, in which you had a picture of the creation, which is rather like a clock, which simply had a mechanical way of doing things. And if the clockmaker had anything to do with the clock after he'd made it, it was to come in occasionally, perhaps clean it up a bit, um, adjust it or whatever. But where the creator had no real connection other than that sort of action um, with the creation, whereas the orthodox understanding and the understanding which has begun to develop again in the West is one in which God is at the heart of all creative processes. So that's the background to my thinking about this. And it has made me talk about the way in which we can think about, we can talk about an enhanced naturalism, a naturalism where we see God at, not only at the heart of all ordinary processes, um, which is precisely what people like St. Maximus tried to enable us to do, uh, but also in terms of miraculous processes that there were one or two people in the patristic period who talked about the way in which we could talk about laws of nature and what were sometimes thought of, although I don't think the term was ever used, as higher laws of nature. They're laws of nature which come into being um, or come into action uh, only when a certain threshold is crossed. And I've pointed to various things in the sciences that point in a comparable direction. Um, there's a sense, for example, um, in what physicists uh, talk about as superconductivity. Normal metals, materials, um, conduct electricity in a really quite well-defined way. I mean, many of your listeners will remember at school talking about Ohm's law where you have a resistance um, and you need a certain applied voltage to get a certain current going through it and so on. But the interesting thing at the beginning of the 20th century was that they discovered a few materials and, you know, this um, set of materials as we know them are growing, where if you take the temperature down below a certain threshold temperature, suddenly, because you've passed that threshold, the material behaves in a very, very different way. Um, it effectively becomes superconducting in the sense that resistance completely disappears. So there's a change of what is called regime. Um, or at least what some scientists call a change of regime. And it's not that the laws of nature have suddenly changed or whatever, it's that the way the laws of nature work in those particular materials is such that once a particular threshold is passed, um, new properties become accessible, if you like. Now, I've used that as one analogy for the way in which the miraculous can actually work, um, that we can see if you like higher laws of nature, a little bit like regime change in this way, something happens when a certain threshold is passed. And I've seen this threshold very much in terms of the human response to God. And if you look at the, you know, some of the great saints of the church, for example, you find the world around them actually to some extent changing. And the, the analogy I've often given is the way in which some of the greatest saints um, have had relationships with wild animals, which seem to transcend the normal fear or whatever. You could think of the story of um, Seraphim and Saroff and the bear, for example. I mean, you know, whether that's purely a legend or based on historical memory, I don't know. But over and over, um, with some Western saints like St. Francis, but with many Eastern ones as well, um, you get this sense of the usual sort of pattern of relationship within the created order being transcended when you get a particular sort of 
response to God on the part of a human being. Um, and what I've spoken about in relation to that is the way in which what we can see happening there, and I take you know that picture in the book of Isaiah about you know the, the leopard lying down with the lamb and so on, is the idea that in such to some extent we can see the miraculous as an anticipation of the world to come. Um, and it happens at least partly, perhaps completely, in terms of the way in which the universe changes when a certain degree of sanctity and response to God actually comes out in a particular human being. So the world around them, to some extent, changes. So that's the general background to the way I've been thinking, the way I see in certain aspects of physics, this notion of regime change, the way in which some in the patristic era seem to be pointing towards what we might call higher laws of nature, which aren't usually operative or at least effective, but which come into sort of um, come into operation when a certain threshold is crossed. And that threshold I see at least partly as being crossed because there is an anticipation of the world to come. So that we have this sense that the world in which we live, we call it the natural world, but I've pointed out the way in which particularly um, the modern theologians like Panayotis and Nelas have talked about the way in which the world that we experience normally from day to day is in fact unnatural. Now I prefer to use the word subnatural because it emphasizes that it's not completely separated from the truly natural world, but the truly natural world is the world for which we were made. It's the world that's talked about in um, the biblical texts of uh, paradise, the Garden of Eden and so on, it's talked about very largely in the New Testament in terms of the new creation. So there's a sense in which the world in which we live is a subnatural world and that what we're aiming at in our spiritual lives is the return to the truly natural. So that affects my way of talking about naturalism. Um, and it seems to me that has lots of um, knock-on effects. In the West, for example, there's been a lot of talk for several generations about what's often called the problem of natural evil. And the question that's been asked is, how is a world that God saw as good, according to the book of Genesis, be one in which, in fact, there's so much natural misery, not just misery due to the misuse of human free will, but, you know, um, the fact that uh, if I go to certain parts of the world, Australia is one of them. You know, I'm told that, well, there was, a, you know, the shark who attacks the swimmer, the spider that's utterly poisonous. Um, it's not so much the case in this country, which is why perhaps I suspect in Britain, we tend to be a little bit more romantic about the natural world because by and large, the natural world, although it rains a lot of the time, is actually pretty good to us. Um, whereas it's not necessarily true elsewhere. And that natural world, if we regard it as subnatural, tends to take away from that problem of natural evil because, and precisely because, it's not the truly natural world that God saw as good when it was created. The truly natural world is the world to which we're heading. Uh, it's the kingdom of God about which we talk, and it's the paradise um, about which the book of Genesis talks. Now we can talk, of, you know, we can argue about whether our understanding of the fall and the expulsion for paradise actually fits in with modern scientific understanding and that we can perhaps talk about in a few minutes um, but nevertheless that general biblical picture in which there are three stages paradise this world and the world to come actually points us away from the problem of this world towards seeing it as part of the what many of the fathers saw as the garments of skin that God gave to Adam and Eve after their expulsion from paradise. The garments of skin are, as Paneotis Nellis puts it, such that the way in which the world now operates um, is in some sense disordered and draws human beings into anguish and, uh, and pain. So um, that's the general background, at least, to the way I, I think about divine action. It's uh, quite uh, useful. Thank you very much. Now, a few uh, uh, points I would like to, to make in, in regard to uh, what you just said, Father Chris. Mm. Um, the, the schema that uh, we draw on the scriptures, um, uh, the paradisal um, uh, stage of uh, 
of the creation and then um, uh, our subnatural i like the uh, the word uh, state of things uh, uh, in this current uh, uh, stage and uh, and uh, the age to come uh, of uh, what we call it we call it perfection you know um, the fulfillment of of god's plan in regard to the universe um, this uh, this schema is uh, is quite useful uh, i think logically and chronologically uh, but it tends sometimes at least in some circles um, especially christian tends to to be misused uh, mm -hmm. in order to draw such a sharp line between um, the original creation and the fallen creation mm -hmm. that uh, uh, from my viewpoint it becomes quite difficult from such a position quite difficult to discuss anything serious in regard to um, uh, the legitimacy of uh, uh, of uh, the scientific inquiry but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll turn to it uh, in, in a minute perhaps and uh, because you mentioned uh, quite a few times certain um, uh, fathers of the early church who actually seem to have a very different understanding of nature, uh, of mm -hmm. God's creation, um, uh, from uh, the usual, let's call it popular Christian uh, uh, view, uh, I'd like to, to point uh, uh, out uh, to the case of St. Simeon the Theologian, uh, so at the end of the 10th century, uh, um, first half of the 11th, uh, one of the greatest um, uh, Byzantine mystics and theologians uh, who actually had a view of, uh, of creation that is a bit non-standard. So uh, yes, uh, he worked with the same scriptural material, um, original creation, fallen creation, and the future glory, but uh, with a with a twist, uh, I, I uh, uh, would like to refer to uh, a work by him known as the first ethical discourse. It's available in English, <clears throat> um, uh, translated by uh, now uh, Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in that first ethical discourse, uh, Saint Simeon. Uh, comes up with uh, with something that at least that's how I read it. Maybe uh, other people uh, uh, would read uh, those passages differently, but that's how I read it. He would refer to, uh, let's call it the original or the first creation uh, as an anticipation mm -hmm. of the end times, which mm -hmm. isn't a novel idea. So no. Sim Sim Simeon uh, leaves uh, at the end of, uh, uh, of the 10th century, uh, early 11th, uh, but the same idea was actually articulated in, in a variety of ways uh, in the very early centuries of Christianity. Perhaps the classical uh, articulation of this approach uh, is found in um, St. Basil the Great's um, uh, famous homilies uh, on the Exaimeron. I don't remember now which homily, but I have written on, on this. Um, he gives a very interesting uh, interpretation to the first line of Genesis. Mm. Uh, for him, uh, in the beginning, God made he uh, heaven and earth, or the heavens and the earth, uh, uh, is actually a prophecy of the future. Mm. And, and, and this, this places the whole discussion mm. on very different uh, parameters. Uh, and instead of drawing that sharp line that actually um, bars any uh, serious conversation between uh, uh, certain uh, Christian believers uh, and uh, the world of science, um, that line disappears. Why? Mm. Because uh, instead of uh, having to, to grapple with um, a fallen world, so mm. subnatural sounds far better, mm -hmm. so a world that is still mm. progressing towards uh, uh, its finality, uh, that sounds much better uh, mm -hmm. than the idea of a radically fallen world whose laws are so uh, unnatural mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that sci what, what the science is actually uh, uh, research these days is just mm -hmm. a, uh, I don't know, um, it's, it's not nature, mm -hmm. which, is, which is, of course, something that 
um, uh, when, when a scientist hears this this kind of discourse, um, mm. uh, the scientist, of course, is disgusted and so, okay, so uh, what, what are you telling me here? And this is so important. This is why it's so important uh, what you, you mentioned uh, a couple of times, that in reality, uh, the early Christian discourse, the discourse of, uh, uh, of many church fathers, even in the medieval uh, times, uh, did not uh, bypass the idea of nature. Actually, these mm. people dealt with nature, but they Absolutely. dealt it in, in, in a way uh, mm. that you can call it, um, uh, let's say, uh, in, in modern parlance, uh, theistic. So uh, mm. nature, uh, a richer nature, a richer concept mm. of nature, which is open to God and behaves strangely, as you said, mm. with those shifts of, what was that, regime? Yeah, mm. uh, okay, uh, where, where, where nature behaves differently, but this isn't because the laws of nature are suspended or blown up by the divine intervention. It, it, it's because... Uh, in reality, they, they seem to be, to, to go with Simeon and St. Basil, uh, mm -hmm. like an anticipation of the, the eschatological laws of creation. And mm -hmm. I think if we, if we uh, discuss in, in, in this way, uh, uh, from the outset, the presuppositions of any conflict between uh, our Christian doctrine of creation and mm -hmm. uh, the theory of evolution, uh, broadly understood as cosmic evolution, not only biological evolution, um, uh, these presuppositions disappear. What do you reckon? I think that's right. I think it's important to recognize, as you rightly said, that a number of people in the patristic era, when they talked about paradise of this world and the world to come, they didn't necessarily see them straightforwardly um, as a sequence. Um, and there was uh, a, a, an extent to which they saw the story of paradise as an anticipation um, or prediction almost of the world to come. In somebody like St. Maximus, um, as I understand it, for instance, he, he, sees, um, he, he sees creation and fall as simultaneous. So, in fact, paradise becomes purely a sort of theoretical thing that might have existed, but in practice didn't. Um, and in the background to that, I says, there is something, I think, in that patristic understanding. It comes out of the speculations of Origen, uh, who was an early Christian philosopher, who was widely regarded as being a little bit over-speculative. But nevertheless, it has an effect on the way in which people thought about those particular issues. And some modern Orthodox theologians, um, Sergius Bulgakov, for example, talked about the way in which we shouldn't see the paradise story as a historical story. It is, as he put it, a meta-historical story. Um, and there are others who have talked about the way in which if we're to talk about the fall, it's not a fall within this world, it's a fall into um, a, what he, a, you know, a space-time universe. So there are all sorts of major issues around um, that particular question. And it's important, as you rightly say, to recognize that we don't have to read paradise as something that must have happened in this world, and then we got, ex then we got expelled from paradise as a historical thing. It's a theological pointer to the way in which what we're made for ultimately is not this world, despite the fact that this world, you know, has its sacramental aspects. We can see God working in and through it, but ultimately this world exists precisely as the world through which we are drawn towards the world to come. Um, and that is the important thing. So I, this word is one of the reasons I prefer the word subnatural to unnatural, because it's not saying this world has nothing to do with the natural world um, that God intends. It's rather to say um, that there are aspects of it which are to some extent disordered. And therefore all those things which come under the heading of the problem of natural evil actually get worked out within that context in a way which is actually quite rare in Western Christian thinking about that issue. Um, so that's an important thing, I think, in relation to this, so that we can talk about, you know, 
what some of the fathers talk about as the garments of skin in which we're clothed, which are, are what is necessary for us to survive in this world, and which also are part of God's um, gift to us, if you like. I mean, again, Paniotis Nellas um, talks about it as uh, a second blessing to a self-exiled humanity, so that the world in which we live is still a blessing. It's not completely removed from the natural world ultimately intended by God. Um, it is a second blessing, but nevertheless, it has aspects which for us can sometimes be uncomfortable because it's the world in and through which we're drawn towards what God ultimately intends for us. Yeah, and, and I assume what we would consider extraordinary signs, miracles, wonders, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth, uh, if we understand them as revealing uh, deeper or higher laws of nature, which is personally mm -hmm. how I understand these things, yeah, uh, that anticipate um, uh, the age to come, mm -hmm. um, then we are given already in the here and now, in this sub-natural world, mm -hmm. uh, we are given signs of, uh, of a normality that somehow uh, casts light, in retrospect, mm -hmm. casts mm -hmm. light, light upon the value of this very time and place where we are, upon this mm -hmm. very universe, Absolutely. and um, uh, we shouldn't discard at all the idea of, uh, of a nature that uh, requires uh, our uh, research, as Father um, uh, John Mandorf put it in, in his book, uh, the uh, Byzantine Theology, mm -hmm. um, but also a world that uh, should be seen uh, through a sacramental lens, as you uh, rightly put it. Um, in, in this case, in this case, rather than um, uh, going for the logic of either or, uh, either mm -hmm. uh, a sacramental view of things, uh, or uh, a scientific naturalistic view of things, in mm -hmm. reality, if we have this uh, richer concept of nature, which derives from our uh, more nuanced understanding of divine uh, agency, divine uh, action in the world, as you uh, uh, described it earlier, uh, then uh, the presuppositions of, uh, of uh, uh, in principle conflict between uh, faith-based uh, perspectives uh, uh, of reality uh, and the scientific worldview, these presuppositions uh, do not exist. And, and therefore, uh, perhaps uh, against this backdrop, we are invited to uh, consider how we deliver uh, the doctrine of creation uh, mm -hmm. in uh, this age of science and technology rather than uh, simply parroting or quoting um, uh, old patristic stances or biblical for that matter, um, we uh, draw on the spirit uh, of that uh, traditional view of things, uh, but implement that spirit uh, into the very flesh of our scientific culture. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's right. And um, as you say, I mean, if you read the Bible or the fathers, some of the fathers anyway, at a superficial level, you do apparently have this conflict where you seem to have to choose between one and the other. But as we spoke about last week, um, that is to read them at a superficial level. We can see in many of the fathers a far more nuanced understanding. Um, and again, I mentioned Origen just now, that early Christian philosopher who was a bit over speculative, but who nevertheless affected patristic thinking enormously. And he was the one who more than anybody else put forward the idea that there were three levels of reading scripture. There was the literal, there was the moral, and there was a sort of spiritual, often allegorical way of reading scripture. And what came out of that, and he was quite explicit about this, was that if we believe there are good reasons to set aside the literal reading of scripture, and to focus instead on the moral and the spiritual reading of scripture, um, that's perfectly okay. And it's very interesting that the state, the place where he stated that most explicitly in his writings was actually quoted right at the beginning of um, an anthology of his writings that was put together 
uh, by St. Basil and one of the St. Gregory's, I forgot which one it was. Yeah, St. Gregory the Theologian, uh, the so-called Nazienses. I think that's right. It's a, it's a book called the Philokalia, which is not the same as the modern Philokalia, which is an anthology. But this is to say, they themselves put together an anthology of origins writings. And at the very beginning, that statement comes out. So there we have a very explicit understanding in the patristic era um, of how we are to read the scriptures. Now, of course, not all the fathers applied that to the, um, to the creation accounts in Genesis, but some of them most certainly did. You, you know, quite a few of them said, look, this idea of there being six different days where God did this and then that and then the other. But they said, you know, this points us towards philosophical truths. We can certainly read it in a way which is uh, useful for us. But ultimately, you know, they said, the world came into being instantaneously at the word of God. And some of them also quite explicitly talked about the way in which what God created were seeds that would ultimately come to fruition. Um, and so, you know, the creation in that sense was extended over time, it continues today. And if we approach evolution from that point of view, it just becomes unproblematical. It's part of the way in which we can see God working as creator, not just at the beginning in the sense of at the beginning of time, but working timelessly that the fiat um, of God, the let it be, is in fact something that happens outside of time, but its effects actually get expanded through time. So we have what's sometimes called uh, the, the notion of continuous creation. And that it seems to be is something which creates no problem uh, in relation to evolution because it's precisely the sort of things it points at. Now, it is true that within evolution as it's understood in a neo-Darwinian way, some people have an immense problem with the notion of chance because you know th that scientific thing says that in fact chance happenings, chance mutations and so on are an intrinsic part of that. But within the sciences, we actually have an interesting developing understanding of what's sometimes called convergent evolution. Um, Simon Conway Morris is the person who has perhaps most, you know, in the scientific world, tried to explore what that means. And what it actually means is just because chance is involved in a process, it doesn't mean that the end product is not to some extent, perhaps to a great extent, uh, predictable. Um, a very simple example without going into science at all is if I had the money to put into a gambling casino, I wouldn't have to mess about with the roulette wheels to make a, um, you know, to make a profit out of my casino. I know very well that the way the whole thing is set up without cheating at all is designed so that it's very unlikely that I'm going to make a loss. Um, and one can actually see something perhaps of the same sort of thing happening within the created order just because chance is involved at least as, from the scientific perspective in the evolutionary process that doesn't mean that something isn't so to speak the designed end goal just as the designed end goal if i own a casino is the profit i'm going to get for it so simon conway morris would claim that the evolutionary process is set up in such a way that actually you and I having this type of conversation, or at least the possibility of you and I having this conversation is built into the way that the cosmos was from its very beginning. So again, we can tie that to that sort of picture that you get um, in Maximus, for example, where the logoi of creation of which he talks, not only in a sense, make things behave as they do. They also draw them towards the divine realm. They draw them ultimately towards um, the world to come, but they also draw us to some extent to various intermediate stages, such as you know, the way in which human beings have actually come out of that process. So um, I think you're absolutely right. We don't have to have evolution versus biblical or patristic faith. We can actually use the evolutionary process as it's understood within neo-Darwinism, but we can give it a theological interpretation. We can actually say, this is the way that God has acted. Um, and as Elizabeth Theokritoff and her husband George once said in a very interesting paper, which was a 
a rather critical review of the views of Father Seraphim Rose on evolution, who, I mean, Father Seraphim, as you know, didn't like the whole evolutionary thing. And he thought it was actually, you know, it only had ever come about, he said, more or less, because people didn't think that God could create the world in, 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 you know, in six days, etc. And as Elizabeth and George put it, many believers believe in evolution, not because they don't believe God could have done anything like that. It's because the evidence points to the fact that in practice he didn't. God actually did make the world in this particular way through a particular very long process. Um, and it is the evidence on which you know, the scientific understanding is based. And people often get this wrong in terms of evidence. They talk about evolution. They say, oh, it's just a theory. Um, and the important thing about a scientific theory, at least a well-established scientific theory like evolution, is precisely that it has good evidence for it. And often it actually has independent streams of evidence pointing towards it. If you look at how Darwin first thought about evolution, he thought about it, he came to the idea largely because he could see the way in which quite closely related species and subspecies were related to each other. He could also see things in animal breeding and farming, for example, which pointed in a, in a, in a similar suggestion, uh, direction. But he didn't, for example, know anything about genes. Genetic understanding actually came a little bit later, largely through a Roman Catholic priest, interestingly. Again, it wasn't a sort of secular anti-religious thing. Um, but that genetic understanding, even when it reinforced the sorts of things that Darwin had said, we still didn't really know how genes worked. But by the time in the mid 20th century, we understood the structure of DNA. We developed techniques even more recently in which we can look at the details of the genetic makeup um, of all creatures in practice. Then what you actually have is, you know, independent streams of evidence all pointing towards the validity of what we now call the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Because of course, we don't think about the whole evolutionary process exactly as Darwin did, because we now know more. We now know about the genetic process. We now know about the chemical basis to that sort of process of genetic selection and so on. Um, and so it's very important to, you know, that we don't sort of talk about, you know, the Big Bang or evolution or whatever as just theories. If something is a well-established theory in science, that doesn't mean, of course, it's been absolutely verified. The intellectual adventure of science goes on. Um, and it may well be that as happened in the early 20th century, our present understanding of evolution will get incorporated in a much wider framework, just as New Newton's mechanics um, in the early 20th century got incorporated into the relativistic understanding of Einstein. But that doesn't mean that Newton's way of looking at things you know, was completely bypassed as a, as, a, as a way of looking at the fundamentals of the way the universe works, then yes, it's true that Einstein is much more coherent than Newton. And we have good evidence for that now. But the interesting thing is, if you're a physicist, um, which of course I was originally, you still use Newton's equations quite often, simply because there are many, many situations, in fact, almost any situation in which velocities much less than the speed of light um, are involved, when in fact it's much easier to use Newton's equations than it is to use um, Einstein's, which are you know, a little bit more complicated to say the least. So um, we've really got to understand to some extent what science is, why scientists believe that there are certain really quite well established theories, there are other theories, hypotheses, if we like to call them, which are less well established and which in fact often have what one philosopher of science um, talked about as auxiliary hypotheses. They're often, you know, they're not so well established. There's research going on to sometimes competing research programs going on to try to underline one particular auxiliary hypothesis at, the ex uh, 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 hypothesis at the expense of another. But that's the way that science works. I mean, the, the scientific process, and I talk about this in my book, um, Science and the Christian Faith, it's very important if once we understand the way in which science works, which is actually quite difficult for people who haven't any real scientific experience, um, then we can begin to at least feel our way towards understanding how 
theology on the one hand and science as it is now on the other actually can interact with each, each other, not by sort of theology giving way to science and say, oh, well, you know, science can never be absolutely verified. Therefore, you know, we can just treat it as just a theory, um, but rather we can give it a theological interpretation to the science we believe is robust at the moment. Um, and therefore, you know, conflict just doesn't come into that. It's sometimes quite difficult. You know, I've sort of struggled with some of these issues over several decades, but nevertheless, it's quite possible to do it. And it's exactly as you said in our last talk, um, what people like St. Basil the Great uh, were doing in the fourth century. They were interpreting theological insights, which came from both the biblical literature and the tradition as it had developed up to that time. And they were expressing it in terms of the theological and philosophical understanding that was there now. And that is the pro didn't, isn't a process that ended with his death or with the death of, who should we call the late, last of the fathers, St. Gregory Palamas, perhaps. It's something that still goes on. Um, and I think people like Metropolitan Christos Ware have actually said, you know, that we're not to regard the patristic age um, as an age which you know, is somehow over, you know, done and dusted. There may be theologians, you know, in the more recent past, there may be theologians in the future, who in the very long term future may be regarded as fathers in just the way that Gregory Palamas is now, or um, you know, others were in the, in the more distant past. Yeah, uh, by all means, of course. Uh, I, uh, I per personally, I, I don't uh, ever use um, uh, the phrase uh, patristic age, uh, mm. um, at least referring it to a, a, a past age or a past uh, in past mm. tense. I always refer to it as an ongoing phenomenon. Mm. Uh, I, I'd like to, uh, given that we, uh, we are talking so much about the fathers, I, I'd like to return to another patristic example uh, uh, St. Basil's younger brother, uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, mm -hmm. in, in a little researched uh, work uh, of his, um, an apology of the Exaimeron, uh, I can understand why this book is avoided by many Christians. There's so much science, according mm -hmm. to uh, the, the notion of science uh, in the fourth century uh, uh, Christian era, there's so much science there and so little theology and spirituality that one might wonder why would a church father write something like that? That's mm. actually a treatise, a robust treatise of mm. natural philosophy. Mm. Yeah? So it's not natural theology, a robust treatise of uh, natural philosophy according to the available uh, uh, scientific knowledge of uh, fourth century uh, AD. Now, in, in that book, uh, which I started sort of to uh, to scratch a bit, you know, and and, and see uh, what uh, uh, where we, it, it might uh, uh, lead me. I found in a couple of instances a very interesting approach to uh, the topic of creation. My suspicion is that it, it draws on uh, on origin, uh, whom you mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm uh, not uh, so knowledgeable of origin, therefore I won't uh, go beyond this point. Uh, but uh, as St. Gregory of Nyssa uh, articulates the topic, it, it goes like this. Even in Genesis 1, so the narrative of creation, we have two different perspectives that uh, uh, go hand in hand, and they uh, run so smoothly together that we actually think it's just one perspective. He, he refers okay. to the, the first line of Genesis in the beginning of uh, God made heaven and earth, and the rest of the chapter, or the rest of the narrative. He observes a big difference. On the one hand, the first line of Genesis uh, articulates something that might look like a divine viewpoint, mm. but all things are mentioned together in summary. In summary, he actually um, um, uh, plays around the first phrase in, in the uh, Greek uh, uh, Septuagint, the, the Greek translation of, uh, of Genesis. Uh, and, and he uses uh, alternatively, uh, en archi in the beginning, and en kephaleo, which is a, a, another translation from the third century, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, a translation made by uh, um, Aquila, I think, uh, uh, a um, uh, Hellenistic Jew. 
uh, and uh, he he uses these two uh, two phrases, and he says, well, in the beginning or in summary, and kefaleo meaning in summary, yeah, God made heaven and earth, and that's the divine vantage point. And from the divine vantage point, the entire creation is this. Yep. 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 It comes out in one go fully from mm. beginning to end. Mm. But then in the rest of the narrative, we have a human perspective, Gregory says. Mm. But that, that's amazing. Mm. Uh, because we people can't get uh, the whole knowledge of the universe in one go. Mm. We are told about it well, with the means of uh, 3,000 years, uh, mm. uh, whatever ago, you know, the cultural means of that age. Uh, mm. We are told uh, sequentially, uh, mm. we are given uh, insights into the mystery of creation, you know, in stages, because that's how our mind works. Mm. We work sequentially. So, and this is a gradual process that, as you said, actually unfolds. Our process of understanding the creation, mm. uh, God's uh, made, uh, or the God made, uh, God given universe. This is an unfolding process, an ongoing process. And we use, in order to make sense of, uh, of the processes uh, of nature, uh, whatever available sciences we have, from the sciences of antiquity to those of late antiquity in the Middle Ages, modern ages, and uh, uh, today. Uh, but Gregory says that these two perspectives do not collide and do not mm. cancel each other. There are two different perspectives. As a person of faith, I go very well with in the being God made everything. Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. My faith allows me to do, to do that. But I'm also a man of this age and of this culture. Mm -hmm. And I go for the human perspective, to use Gregory's um, uh, mm -hmm. term, uh, the human perspective, uh, which requires a gradual unveiling of things via, in our case, in the case of uh, the contemporary uh, scientific culture, uh, of research and um, analysis and experiment and theorization and verification and confirmation or denial uh, of whatever we have found out. So that's, I think, a very important uh, topic. Uh, and uh, as uh, St. Gregory, many others like him did not see any uh, kind of conflict between uh, a faith-based perspective, which is, mm -hmm. in his words, divine perspective of things, uh, and the human perspective, which draws on uh, the insights of uh, the natural sciences, uh, whatever sciences are available uh, at this age or that age. Now, going back to uh, Nellis, uh, whom you mentioned a few times, I think he captured uh, beautifully uh, this patristic wisdom when he said, and by the way, I cons consider Nellas uh, uh, a church father of our age. Uh, He's certainly a very significant writer. There's no doubt about that. So. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Nellas uh, had this uh, beautiful analogy of an icon. Look at the icon. And we have some icons here. Okay. Look at an icon. And uh, you have uh, uh, a scientist and a believer, uh, perhaps the same person sometimes, like in your case and many other cases, a scientist and a believer, or both scientist and believer. Now, the scientist in you, when, uh, uh, when he or she looks at, uh, at the icon, um, begins with uh, what uh, the scientific method requires. Okay, so this is the object, let's measure the object. Let's see, is it um, uh, uh, cardboard or is it uh, wood uh, uh, or is it marble? Uh, what kind of wood it is? Uh, let's make the, the, the chemical analysis of, of that material. Ah, uh, cedar or whatever, uh, eucalyptus or whatever, you know, and uh, going beyond this, you know, uh, the paint. Uh, uh, is it a true paint or a natural paint or uh, artificially made um, whatever device stuff? and so on. As an artist, you would say, uh, ah, proportion and beauty and so on. Nella says nothing of, of this kind of analysis of what the, the icon is made of, uh, uh, what the, the paint is made of, and so on and so forth. Nothing of this had, uh, has any impact on my faith. But when I look at the same icon uh, with the eyes of a, of a believer, what I see there is, uh, as we know, uh, as we keep saying in the Orthodox tradition, uh, a window towards 
uh, the other side of things, the other side of reality. I see the image of a person, uh, and this image, like a photography, you know, mm -hmm. uh, reminds me of the real person that actually lived or lives, uh, is in heaven, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, the icon challenges me to establish a connection, send an SMS, uh, say a prayer, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, and, and Nella says, well, when I approach the icon uh, in this way as a believer, again, this has no impact on the scientific mm -hmm. analogy or, or, or analysis of the object. In other words, we have two perspectives on the same uh, object, the icon. Mm -hmm. The way for Gregory of Nyssa, there are two perspectives on the universe, one divine and, mm -hmm. and one human. And mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, trying to uh, oppose uh, creation and evolution uh, in mm -hmm. the warfare of creationism and evolutionism, the two mm -hmm. ideologies of our time, uh, we can uh, understand uh, with um, uh, the wisdom of our tradition or through the eyes of, uh, of uh, the fathers and the mothers of uh, ancient times and the mid Middle Ages and closer to us, mm -hmm. we can understand uh, the universe as mystery, life as mystery. And this is why I love so much uh, your sacramental perspective, because when, when we say a sacramental approach to nature, this mm -hmm. means we acknowledge its mystery. And the mystery cannot be smashed into pieces by way of, I don't know what, uh, um, a doctrinal statement or uh, scientific analogy. The mystery is revered, is considered uh, or circumscribed from a number of perspectives, and no perspective uh, is uh, uh, off, uh, the, off the book or whatever it's, it's called. Off the, you know? um, um, we use all the tools that we have in order to consider uh, the mystery. Uh, would this uh, fit well uh, uh, in, in your schema of things? Uh, would this perspective uh, 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 coincide or uh, converge towards what you say? It would. it would. I think the icon is an interesting one, though, because in a sense, the you know the wood, the paint, the way it's been you know uh, set up, so to speak, by uh, by the icon painter or writer, um, is the means through which the icon becomes what it is when it's looked at with the eyes of faith. Um, and you'll remember the way in which uh, St. John of Damascus, for example, actually saw that as pointing, uh, in his defense of icons, this was actually pointing towards an incarnation or sacramental understanding of precisely those things which the scientists might immediately see. Um, that in, as he said, you know, as John Damascus put, put, puts it, you know, it is through matter that my salvation was brought, was brought about. So that to see things in those two ways, the trouble is if you just do, you know, do it completely differently, the thing is that any real scientist, even one who doesn't have a particular religious faith, would, would also matter simply because they're human have a recognition that it's not just a piece of wood with some pigment on the front, that there, you know, that it at least for some people has a specific meaning. Um, even if they can't get hold of that meaning, they will have a sense of its beauty. And this takes us back to something we mentioned very briefly um, in the last broadcast, which was the whole notion of natural contemplation. That um, again, you get in the patristic era and it's, it comes out in, uh, in, into the modern world in various ways. Um, Bruce Fultz, for example, talks about it in relation to ecological issues. Um, in the West, it's not unknown because uh, Thomas Merton in particular has sort of picked this up and had a very interesting effect on the way that Western spirituality has developed um, in the 20th century and early 21st centuries. That you contemplate the natural, and we can go deeper and deeper into that contemplation. But the interesting thing is about um, the way in which that theology, uh, that sort of contemplation of nature, it didn't necessarily bypass scientific understanding. Um, it was actually seen as partly, mostly perhaps related to a sort of noetic perception, a perception which is ultimately intuitive rather than analytical, but it could bring in um, 
what one might call the material or measurable aspects of the creation. And the two could actually be combined. That's the way in which natural contemplation develops in the ancient world. And it, it seems to me that we need to do exactly the same now. If we actually ignore you know, the material, measurable and everything else, then in fact, what we're doing is trying to spiritualize the icon, if you like, um, so much that we cease to recognize, as John Damascus recognized, that it's precisely because it's a material object that it actually can have the effect that it actually has on us. Um, and that, again, is something which is absolutely fundamental, I think, to our orthodox understanding, that it's in and through the material that, um, you know, whether it's in terms of natural contemplation, whether it's in terms of the use of icons, whether it's in the sacraments themselves, the water of baptism, the bread and the wine um, of, 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 of the Eucharist, that God works in and through those things. And to actually have an understanding of those things as material objects, rather than trying to spiritualize everything, um, is actually, I think, really quite fundamental to the way in which we need to develop um, what we might call a spirituality in relation to creation. And uh, you're right that creationism versus evolutionism, in a sense, is false. And it's false for a number of reasons, not only because it misreads science and the way in which science can be interpreted theologically, but also because there is a sort of a false spiritualizing or element, almost a Gnostic element. Um, I mean, many of your viewers will know that the early Christian Gnostics, um, you know, in a sense had this sense that, well, the material world was somehow quite bad and somehow our, our job was to escape it. And the Christian understanding has always been quite the opposite of that. It said, first of all, Christ came in the flesh. You know, he was truly human as well as truly, uh, tr truly divine. It, it was a union without confusion and they took centuries to work out what that meant. But nevertheless, they always affirmed it. And that early Christian heresy, which says, well, you know, this was God coming into the world, but he wasn't really human and wasn't really material. The church fought that tooth and nail and, and rightly so. So our whole spirituality depends on our understanding of the way in which God works in and through the way in which material things can become transparent to his presence, his glory. And ultimately as Christians, we see that fundamentally in the incarnation in Jesus Christ, but we also see it in all these other ways that we've talked about today. Um, and so it's getting away from a false spiritualism, which I think is part of the problem that we actually are dealing with now that we have a, a we have a way of thinking about things and doing things which doesn't really take on the full breadth of our Christian understanding of the purposes of the creation um, and that in fact you know what we mean by eternal life what we mean by the world to come isn't an escape of some sort of soul stuff you know, away from the body it's actually the you know it's the transfiguration of the whole creation in which we will have a resurrection body now so paul of course said you know we will you know, we, we die a physical body we are raised a spiritual body so we recognize that there was a degree of discontinuity but there's also a degree of continuity and in gregory of nyssa you get this particularly you know because on one level he's saying it's this body which is raised, but on the other hand, he, you know, he's actually saying, but somehow it will be lighter and more aerial. It's not quite this sort of, you know, rather gory body, you know, which is subject to death and illness and, and all the rest of it. So in Gregory, you could see that sort of struggling with two things. It's a genuine continuity, and yet it, there is a discontinuity in the sense that there's a transfiguration. It's just like the disciples uh, at Christ's transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. It wasn't that they saw something completely different in Christ, but they saw him glorified and they couldn't bear that. <laughs> that just would cover their eyes. Um, but nevertheless, it's a genuine continuity. And that's what we see when we talk about resurrection, that the transfiguration that they experienced on that table um, is again a sort of, it's an anticipation of the world to come, of the way in which the glory of God shines through the material. 
It's not a, 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 a change of regime again. <laughs> well, you could regard it as a change. I mean, that's not a bad, as I say, it's quite a useful understanding, I think, that sort of sense of change of regime. It was something I didn't make up myself. I actually got it from John Polkicord, but he didn't actually take it very far. And it often seems to me that Western Christian theologians they threw us some very interesting balls, but they're not quite sure what to do with them. We have, so to speak, you know, to use a cricket metaphor, which for your Australian um, viewers will be a useful one. We've got the bat that could actually deal with that ball in the proper way. <laughs> very, very, very interesting indeed. Uh, Father Chris, thank you very much for uh, for your insights, your, your wisdom. Uh, it's such a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I, I wish you all the best. It's Thank been lovely you. to be with you again. So, 